is going to be Matt Newman. Um, Matt is a senior research uh, scientist and um, he is part of the Atmosphere Ocean Processes team. And uh, he will be talking about was the February 2021 cold air outbreak over the central United States a subseasonal forecast of opportunity? Okay, is that, uh, is that showing? Yeah, it's perfect. Okay, uh, let's see, it's not yet full screen, I think. I see a bar on the right, but it's big and readable. It's weird. Yeah, I don't know why. It seems to be full screen here. Oh, yeah. Now it is. All right. Uh, so this is work that I've been doing uh, with uh, John Albers, <clears throat> excuse me, and Sam Lillo here. Uh, and uh, this is related to a couple of questions that we've been particularly interested in. Uh, people remember my lecture, they, they were things I was focused on there too. Uh, first, can we identify high scale uh, S2S forecasts ahead of time, given that on average, the scale is very low. It's really probably too low on average to be used in many circumstances, but clearly the case to case events can be skillful. If we can do that, can we in particular identify the dynamical processes responsible for these high school forecasts so that we have some confidence in where that uh, prediction of high school is coming from? And the example I'll use here is for NAO. And finally, to, to uh, focus on a single event was the recent cold air outbreak in the central US, one of these potentially high scale forecasts. So the way we uh, do this is with something called the linear inverse model or LIM where we're basically uh, representing the system in a fairly simple way, a linearly uh, predictable portion and a uh, stochastic uh, unpredictable part. And we're able to separate variability into these two components under our coarse grained assumption, where we're, where we're uh, basically observing and assuming that the nonlinearities are fast in the system so that they're unpredictable compared to the linear predictable dynamics, which are typically on a slower time scale. And, and that's particularly a good uh, approximation for S2S time scales because what we're doing is we're not predicting individual weather events, which are unpredictable beyond about two weeks, but rather the aggregates of those events. In a system like this, the anomalies can still grow and evolve through non-orthogonal eigenmode destructive to constructive interference even though all the individual eigenmodes of this linear operator here are stable. And we can get this empirically. That's kind of the main idea here, although one could in principle do this uh, in a forward sense from first principle. So in this system, uh, forecasts are pretty simple. You just solve this equation. The ensemble mean uh, forecast is written down simply. Uh, then your probabilistic forecast or categorical forecast come about because the ensemble mean is undergoing some mean shift. So basically the scale is entirely coming about from this predictable component and the uh, PDF forecasts are likewise entirely uh, from that just shifted left or right, depending on the mean signal. So that immediately implies that we can use a, a forecast signal and noise ratio in a system like this to identify the forecast that we expect ahead of time to have high uh, scale, we, in other words, we're calculating at the time of forecast. It's still uh, state dependent, but it's not a nonlinear state dependence. It's an entirely linear process. And uh, it's obviously going to be dependent upon the forecast lead time. So these are the two hindcast and forecast data sets that I'm going to be going through. Uh, we have a limb that was trained over this period of time. And we're looking at hindcast for winter time, 97, 2016. We're using seven day running mean JRA data listed here on the right. Uh, and to make the forecast scale uh, quasi independent, we use a tenfold cross validation. And we're comparing it to the EC uh, IFS operational in 2017, which we obtained from the S2S data set. And that was mean bias corrected. Uh, that scale comparison uh, for the globe has been published earlier, but today we're just going to look at the NAO. And then we'll also look at real-time forecasts for the cold air outbreak event. In this case, we're going to be using a real-time limb that's uh, currently being transitioned to CPC. It's, it's running there currently, which is basically the same as this limb, or this limb here, except we're also including North American two meter air temperature because that's what we're trying to predict. And uh, that's been running since about December of last year. 
And then we're comparing that to a more recent version of the IFS uh, so that we can get the uh, real-time uh, forecasts for this period from that as well. Okay, so first just looking at the NAO, uh, here is uh, a way of, of identifying high versus low skill uh, forecasts ahead of time. We use the limb signal noise ratio and we stratify both the limb scale, the limb forecasts and the NAO forecasts by whether we expect them to be high skill or low skill. So we're taking the top 15% of expected high skill forecasts and that's shown as the solid line. We're showing the skill of those forecasts and the dotted line shows the skill of the remaining forecasts. And we can see that in both these cases, the limb is picking out the weeks three, four, five, and six a uh, high skill uh, of the IFS and of itself. It's able to identify that pretty cleanly and separate it from the lower uh, skill of uh, forecasts, which we don't expect to be as uh, skillful. So again, this is kind of immediately suggesting that at least in this case, the extent to which the limb is not just predicting its own skill, but also predicting the IFS skill uh, suggests that, that the skill is coming, uh, even in the IFS is coming primarily from shifts of the mean, uh, the ensemble mean, not so much from changes in spread and skill. And in fact, we've checked that a little bit uh, for the Pacific in particular, and there's no obvious spread skill relationship in the IFS or obviously in the LAM. Now we wanna do is we wanna diagnose where this high skill is coming from. So we dig a little deeper into the dynamics of the limb. We can do an eigen analysis of that limb forecast operator and look at the different eigenmodes that essentially represent how different aspects of dynamics evolve uh, over time. And this uh, plot here is just showing all the eigenvalues of all these modes. So there's basically, as one can see, kind of two separate, fairly uh, nicely separate categories. And we use that uh, to do some diagnosis. Uh, here we have a group of modes in blue, which have typically long e-folding times. So these eigenmodes tend to decay uh, on time scales longer than about a month. And they typically are low frequency or even stationary modes. All these modes, it turns out, have uh, a large uh, contribution from SST and stratospheric uh, component uh, of the limb state vector. They have the other aspects as well, but, but they're notable because SST and stratosphere is more important uh, in these modes, whereas the remaining modes do not, by and large, they have shorty folding times, they have no SST component. Uh, interestingly, uh, the MJO is in here as well, which has been a common common thread in a lot of work in the past, a lot of limb analysis in the past. And I should notice there's also, and, and I'll bring this up, there's one, there is one eigenmode, which interestingly is purely stratospheric. It has no SST component. So what do these look like? What does this stratosphere SST subspace, the, the slower uh, subspace look like? This is a bit of an illustration. We take a composite uh, and, uh, uh, at a, of the uh, NAM index at 10 millibars. And then we look at what that composite looks like. Uh, here's the typical cross section, this kind of Baldwin and Dunkerton sort of kind of quasi dripping paint plot. And one sees in fact, something which is, is almost entirely that uh, downward propagating stratospheric eigen mode. So that, that process, the, that uh, de descent from the stratosphere to the troposphere can be rep is, is in fact represented by just a single eigen mode. At the surface, it has a predominantly Atlantic sea level pressure signature. And like I said before, there's no SST associated with that. On the other hand, if we do the same thing, but do a composite lower down at 300 millibars, we find a structure which is much more of a blend. Although there's some of this downward propagating component, it's, it's not so important as other modes, which represent uh, an SST signal more of a, a projection on kind of the non-canonical canonical, non -canonical ENSO, more of a central Pacific uh, anomaly. And the NAO uh, structure is much more uh, um, uh, annular-like. And in fact, what we find is that the, uh, the week three, uh, six high scale forecasts are almost entirely within this joint stratosphere SST subspace. Again, remind you, the black line is the IFS high expected skill. 
and the orange line is the limb high expected scale. So we repeated the analysis by only using this initial conditions in the stratosphere SST subspace, as opposed to the remainder. And almost all this uh, skill is coming about because of that subspace. So that's essentially the predictable part uh, of the system. And that means that the more that an initial condition tends to project in this stratosphere SST uh, joint subspace, a set of eigenmodes, uh, the more, the uh, larger a predictable signal it'll have and therefore potentially higher skill. So let's uh, look at a particular case then. We'll look at the, uh, at this uh, February 2021 cold air outbreak. This is the uh, two week uh, temperature uh, anomaly. It's, it was really impressive. Uh, obviously a lot of uh, records were set, particularly uh, in Northern Texas, uh, had a very large societal impact. Um, and they're still fighting over it in Texas, I understand because of the power outages. And so the question we have basically is, is how well uh, did the, the limb expect this could be predictable? Uh, and what might have contributed to that potential uh, forecast skill. So this is what the CPC official weeks three, four forecast was. Uh, they do a forecast, uh, just two category. They're looking for probability above or below the median temperature. They weren't particularly confident uh, for their forecast in general, 55 is, is pretty low, uh, although their typical uh, probabilities are not a lot higher. But clearly they were going for uh, warmth uh, in a broad part of the US. And that was an unreasonable a, a, a forecast. That's basically what all the, uh, the numerical models were showing. Here's the, the IFS for that period, very strong uh, warming throughout most of the Eastern two thirds of the country for this uh, period of time. And in fact, the CFS and the JMA, uh, which are two other models uh, CPC looks at a lot, they basically were pretty similar. The limb uh, had uh, something pretty different. It was going for pretty pronounced cooling uh, in this region, and in fact had very high probabilities, particularly for a uh, week four. So we were getting up to 75% uh, probability, and a week later, the week three probabilities, we were, we were in the 80s, which is very high, very confident for the limb. And I should point out that the limb is, is a reliable forecast system, so that 80% basically means 80%. All right, so where is the limb uh, getting its forecast from? Primarily, it's getting it from, from this SST stratosphere subspace. And it turns out, without getting into a lot of the other details, this is basically from La Nina uh, that was occurring at this time. And we had obviously a very pronounced La Nina. And so it's picking out uh, this very strong uh, cooling. There is a small weak MJO component uh, and uh, a, a piece of in the stratospheric mode, remember there was a sudden warming early in January, and so we were still in February more at the, at the tail end of that event. Notice, by the way, that these amplitudes here are double this. So these are even weaker relative to this than just the colors uh, make it look. Internal space, obviously there's not much. Again, we're not really expecting there to be much predictability on weeks three and four uh, in the uh, internal subspace. But of course, there can be a large amplitude. It's just because we can't, it's, we can't predict it doesn't mean it's not there. And in fact, we saw that. But in, importantly, in terms of the verification, we also picked up this very strong uh, uh, tropically forced La Nina signal, La Nina uh, SST stratosphere subspace signal. Um, there was a bit stronger MJO uh, than uh, we had predicted uh, and pretty close uh, in terms of the stratospheric mode. Uh, again, remember this is, these amplitudes here are half of that. Okay, so just to conclude then, uh, the limb can predict at the time of forecast, which forecast will be skillful. So it's able to identify about the, the top 15% of high skill uh, NAO forecasts. In other words, uh, forecast skill that, that one might think would be actually usable on these weeks three and four time scales, both of the LIM and in the IFS. And then we, we can use the LIM to decompose uh, all anomalies into these two independent, but importantly, non-orthogonal uh, eigenspaces, uh, subspaces, which we can use to understand uh, where the forecasts of opportunity are coming from, there's an internal subspace which dominates most of the variability. Again, it's important to remember that most variability 
a week three and four time scale is not predictable uh, on these uh, time scales. It's, a, it's this smaller subspace contained within this set of eigenmodes, which we've labeled this joint stratosphere SST subspace, which basically consists of this downward propagating stratospheric eigenmode, which has more of an Atlantic surface signature, and then a group of eigenmodes with joint stratosphere and SST components. Essentially, a lot of this stratospheric uh, component is, is what you might expect if you're getting wave uh, propagation coming out of the tropics, obviously, as you as you're at, when you're at 300 millibars in, in the high latitudes, you're, you're in the stratosphere. So in the context of, of the, uh, the definition that counts as a stratosphere component. And then finally, uh, the North American uh, uh, cold air outbreak of February 2021 was clearly predictable well in advance on S2S timescale. So predicting it four weeks ahead was, uh, was clearly, uh, clearly possible coming primarily uh, from this La Nina uh, signal. And I'll just conclude there. Thank you very much for the nice talk. I'm always amazed um, how skillful these limbs are if Matt designs them. Um, the first question goes to uh, Arun. Hey, thanks, man, for the talk. Uh, nice analysis. Uh, may maybe this is a strange question. So you showed that uh, the limb skill is uh, about the same as IFS. One of the slides. Oh, for the for the NAO, yeah. It's, uh... Yeah, yeah, this one. So given the, these plots and all the models we're predicting about normal anomalies, what would make a forecaster discount the model-based forecast and go with the limb? Uh, oh, you mean in this case? Yeah, yeah. Well, they didn't. In fact, they went with. Well, they, they did not. But <laughs> they should have. But what, what argument they have to follow? Well, I think I, th I think uh, you know we're we're trying to. This has been a really uh, interesting question for us. Trying to get a sense of what are the best uh, guidance tools that we can give the forecasters. Right. So yeah. it's one thing to just to just do this, but working with CPC, which is what we've been doing over the last year, has taught us a lot about how people make the forecasts. And, and one of the things that's become clear is precisely that we want to do more of this sort of diagnosis so that they have this in real time. And we can say to them, look, the reason why we have uh, strong cooling is coming from this La Nina signal. You know, and we can show, I mean, potentially you could show the whole evolution of that. That would be a bit much in real time. But I think with time as they gain uh, experience in using the tool and in a way use is the only way that a forecaster. Right, right. As a, in the forecaster, I have access to 10 different tools and five, six of them, which are model based and predicting warm. It is very hard for them to go out on the limb and take the something which is not, not confer, uh, conforming with the model based forecast. So anyway, you know the problem. Yeah, Yeah. no, I agree completely. Well, the, so the week after this, we were, we were going cold even more strongly I mean, there's very high probabilities and the models were going more along the same lines. So what we were able to do was essentially say to the forecaster at the time, you can be more confident. So they, the forecaster was going cold for essentially a week three forecast, but not going as strong as, as the limb was saying. And so we said, well, you can be more confident. And he did take it into account, which was nice. That was kind of the high point for us so far. Uh, I mean, like I said, it's a learning experience for us trying to see how, how these tools are used in, in real time as opposed to looking at hindcasts and, you know, and, and kind of working out diagnostics. Right. Thank you. Thanks very much. I, I have a comment and a question. Um, I, I'm always, um, what I really like about limbs is that you can decompose that in these different modes. And I think you've shown a beautiful example for this here. Um, you might have said this, but I haven't fully understood it yet. Is there a way to decompose the SSD stratosphere modes into two modes? I know it's there, there's a set of yeah, there's a set. I, it's you know after a while it gets overwhelming, right? I mean, I'm going to sit here and show you every mode. It just becomes a bit much. And again, uh, these are non-orthogonal, so a lot of times what's happening is you're having a couple modes that may all be kicked by noise. In a particular configuration, and they're evolving differently, and it's the 
the sub the entire space that's evolving that matters. Um, but yeah, in principle, we could have focused on you know any other other modes if we wanted to do that. Thank you. Where, where I was going is, is it possible to decouple the SST influence from the stratospheric influence in the coupled mode? Yeah, uh, I mean, we've done that, things like that in other contexts. Uh, we haven't done that here yet, but, uh, but uh, in principle it is, yeah. Thank you so much. Anish has a question. Yep. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, this is really interesting and yeah, lots to think about in terms of um, predicting predictability and how users can use it. And so my question is related to predicting predictability or predicting prediction skill from each of these modes. Like, do we know if like from like climatology or historical forecast, which modes picked up by LIM like contribute more to skill and so the users can trust it more when that uh, signal is coming up, like when you decompose it into different components, right? That if the ENSO or the La Nina signal is strong in the limb, then if that is a mode that is historically um, a mode that contributes to high skill in this framework, then the users can trust it more. Whereas if it's if it's other modes, then um, well, I mean, to some extent, that's what this is here, right? Basically, what we're saying is, if the initial condition had a very high projection on this and yeah. almost no projection on that, then we would say that uh, we don't expect the forecast to be skillful, right? Probably won't produce a large amplitude anyway, but, but uh, you know, the temptation would be to look at the model and say, well, maybe if a model had a higher amplitude, that was because the ensemble wasn't large enough and it, it didn't have enough to kind of average out to something closer to zero. Right, or the model could have something that the limb doesn't have. But in the context of the limb, that's the that's difference. I, I get nervous about, I mean, I, I think it's really interesting when you get one eigenmode that really looks physical, um, because it says, to me, it says that, that that really is a modal structure. You know, mode gets tossed around in our field, you know, all the time to mean a lot of different things. And it's not really very rigorous. There aren't very many modes of the system in a physical dynamical sense. But it really, to me, it really does seem like this is an eigenmode of the system. There's something physical about it. You know, you hit the system in a certain way, you can just, you're ringing a bell and you, you get this eigenmode propagating. Um, there's a, the kind of a four year-ish ENSO eigenmode is, is another one that you see like that. There's a, an MJO eigenmode that comes out of the limb that seems to be robust. But then other than that, you know, everything else is these other modes that are, that are non-orthogonal, and because they're non-orthogonal, they can cover up, you know, those kind of ringing modes, those real eigen modes, uh, in different ways, and you can get different evolution as a result. And it's hard to just look at a particular eigen mode and say, okay, well, that eigen mode is going to give me something, because what really matters is how it combines with all these other eigen modes. And again, that's kind of that's the fundamental aspect of these non-normal systems is you can't. You can't partition variability. You can't partition predictability in terms of these kind of individual mm -hmm. modes that well. So Mary, you said your signal to noise is basically a function of the amplitude, predicted amplitude, right? Yeah, yeah, and, 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 and in, in the limb, it's, it's all signal noise. Now, right. you know, you can get more sophisticated. You could, in principle, have a linear state dependence of the noise. Uh, that would still give you linear predictability. That's kind of another long story, but that's hard to extract out of data. You need a lot more data. Now you have to look at the at higher uh, moments in order to pull that out. And you can get non get some non Gaussian behavior, but it, it's still everything's linearly predictable. But now there there can be some variation of the noise. But we were kind of struck when we looked at least at the IFS and compared it to the LIM in our 2019 paper that. Yeah, it was very hard. You know, there's, you could see a little bit of a signal of a spread skill relationship, but it was really weak and it was really just at the extremes. Thanks. Thanks very much, Matt. Um, so this concludes um, today's uh, workshop. Thanks so much for staying around. Sorry, we ran a little over. And uh, we're looking forward to tomorrow uh, where among uh, some 
fantastic lectures we will hear from the students so thank you very much everyone and have a good afternoon thank, thank you, you. Thank you.